Grace, mercy, and peace are yours. From God, our Heavenly Father, and from our loving Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When a rational person, without much of an agenda, looks around this world, what is it that they can deduce about God? Well, they can see that there's a universe that has order in it. They can see that there is an earth that has conscious sentient creatures on it. And so they would have to come to the conclusion, oh, there must be somebody behind all of this. And then the rational person is going to think the next rational or logical question. They're going to ask themselves, well, but who made the maker? And it's going to dawn on them pretty quickly after seeing all the diversity and the enormity and the amazing stuff in this world and in this universe that, well, this maker, this somebody must have always existed. And if this rational person is so inclined to continue their thinking, they're going to say, well, this God, he he made a universe with edges that we can't see and oceans that we have never reached the bottom of. And so this God is not just eternal, he's powerful. And then they're gonna go to the next conclusion and they're gonna look around and they're gonna see that there is this global, global ecosystem so complex that controls everything on this planet And it's going to dawn on them that they have this incredible work, this machine called the human body that has eyes that can actually see and gather information. And a brain that can take that information from the eyes and the ears and the senses and interpret it all and and kind of tell you whether you're safe or it's dangerous. And in this body that this machine that has been created there is this amazing cardiovascular system that delivers all the right nutrients to all the right cells of the body, but everything gets fed, and you're going to come to the conclusion that this God is just not all brawn, but also brains. He's pretty intelligent. Well, there's always going to be people in this world who are going to deny the existence of God they're going to say that this entire universe, ourselves included, is really nothing more than a, what, a cosmic joke or a cosmic accident. But denying the evidence doesn't make the evidence poof, go away. Not at all. Without even picking up a Bible, the average thinking person, the rational person, can know that there is a God, and that he is eternal, and that he is powerful, and that he is intelligent. God created the world right there at the beginning, when he finished creating that world and saw all that he made, and it was very good, which means that there was nothing wrong with it. There were no design flaws. There was absolutely nothing that could be added to make it more perfect than it already was. But then Adam and Eve, they ran away from their God straight into the arms of the devil. And that's when the misery started to happen. God, I just, full disclosure, God did not create the world this way. We sinners are suffering our own making right now, okay? When bad things happen to good people, and this is the irony of it, we made this situation, not God. We made it. But yet, when bad things happen to seemingly good people or innocent people, we, well, the world does, but even we have this tendency to blame the maker for manufacturing defects, don't we? Yeah, we do. We are at times, you and I, I'm including myself in this, like the teenager, like we were talking about in Bible class, with this black and white worldview and this hyper sense of justice. 
And they live in a home with parents that dearly love this teenager, but they think that, no, this isn't for me. So this teenager runs away. This is what we're like. We run away and we totally ruin our life and we're living on the street, but one day we actually get enough money to be able to call home and just say three words. It's your fault. That's what you and I are like. Job from the Old Testament, he had it all. He had wealth, he had health, he had trust in God, and believe it or not, he had 10 children, and they all actually seemed to have gotten along and liked each other. But then, as you know the story of Job, the devil comes into the presence of God in his courtroom, in his throne room, and he says, I want to be able to test this most righteous of men, Job, and I want to see if he'll break because I'm saying, God, that I can break him. And God said, no, you can't. Go ahead and take your best licks at him. You can do anything you want, but you can't take your life, take his life. And as soon as Job was on the spot, almost within an instant, everything that Job had was gone. His health, his wealth, his children. He started out in a great, pious, Christian, responsive way. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. But then the passage of time and the pain of the disease, well, it ground away at his faith. He knew that God was there, and he knew that God was eternal, and that he was powerful, and that he was intelligent. He knew all that stuff about God, just like you and me, and yet he still raised his fist to the sky, and he demanded of God, why? Why me? What have I done to deserve this? Job in our Old Testament lesson shows us that even we Christians can have, well, Job-like symptoms. Your child is in the hospital. Your child is in the casket. Your loved one is dying young. And we cry out, why? You begin thinking to yourself, Lord, you tell me that you are infinitely powerful and you tell me that you have forgiven me and you tell me that you love me. If all these things are true, why? Why me and not someone out there? Why my child and not me? Why is all of this happening? And then we quickly conclude that there's something wrong with God. That he didn't really mean what he said about loving us and keeping us as the apple of his eye and shadowing us, shadowing us under the shadow of, protecting us under the shadow of his wings. And then we get angry. And then we decide we're gonna distance ourselves until he shapes up. Or we swing the other direction and we conclude, there's something wrong with me. I'm not Christian enough, and so God's got it out for me. He's trying to teach me something here. But neither of those conclusions are true. As certainly as our Epiphany Lord came here into this world to reveal the truth to us about who his Father is and what he's really like, 
So too, in the same way, the Holy Spirit came to the Apostle Paul to clarify this little matter about why bad things happen to good people. Enter Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. There is a fair amount of information that a rational thinking person can learn and know about God by looking around in the world. This is not one of them. When the Apostle Paul wrote, we know, he wrote, we know, not because we have seen it with our own eyes, but because God says it. And God can't lie. This passage, Romans 8, 28, describes this complex cosmic ecosystem that dwarfs the understanding of human beings. And without taking away the human capacity for making decisions, what this passage and the following two passages are basically telling us is that God is working. He is working in your life. He orchestrates and he harnesses every single event that happens in this world that comes into contact with your life or things that you don't even know about. The little things and the big things and everything in between. All to work the good that he has promised to bring into the life of a Christian. And then he goes on. The rest of this passage, it teaches us exactly what God means by the good that he's going to work out for each one of us. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. The verbs in this passage, they make this wonderful little sequence, almost like pearls on a necklace that begins before time and it goes squarely right through time and it ends beyond the end of time. Let me paraphrase. It's kind of like God is saying this. Before I even created the world, I knew you. Let that heat your head up for a minute. And it's not like I knew you in the sense like I knew what you would be like. I knew you as only a loving, gracious, creating God Father can know his creature. That's how I knew you. And in my mind, I already set you apart to be my own, my own precious possession. And then after you were born, I made sure that you were brought to faith in Jesus Christ, your Savior. All because of the promises that I made through him to you through this whole plan of salvation called the forgiveness of sins. And through that faith that my spirit planted in your heart, you were, well, the church is going to use this churchy term called justified. You were, you were made right with me. You were guilty of sin but you were acquitted. You were justified, you were redeemed, and you were forgiven. On account of that, my child, on account of that, I worked all things together in this world for one goal, to make you 
my dearly loved child. But then there's one more verb in this wonderful pearl of, of sequence of, of verbs here. And, and it's the verb that is going to happen in the future. It still lies in the future. Those he justified, he also glorified. At the end of time, your Jesus is going to kick open your grave, your dusty and decaying body, and he is going to raise it up, and he is going to restore your flesh, and he is going to reinfuse your soul back into your body, and he is going to give you this glory that he has promised. In other words, he is going to come back at some point in the future, and he is going to complete the good work that he has started. He is going to finish what he started in your life. He'll raise your body, you're put back together, you are now glorified with the same kind of glorious body that he has. He's going to come back and he's going to restore this world right back to the very same, no less perfection that he did when he first created it, right back to that time when it was very good. And that heaven, that heaven will be your eternal home with your God and Father, the one who has graciously orchestrated all of this to make you his own. That day, when God glorifies you, and that eternity that follows, that's what Paul is talking about, is the good. And it's his purpose for which he makes all things work together in your life. That's what God the Father is aiming for. That's what God the Father has always been aiming for. And the truth of the matter is that he can't miss because he's eternal, he's powerful, and he's intelligent. But that almost sounds like a computer, doesn't it? Because there is a side to this God that is all heart. He is gracious, and he is merciful, and he is loving. And he has revealed it to you in his epiphany son, our epiphany Lord, Jesus Christ. See, the truth of the matter is We may never, ever be able to understand how all of this bad that God allows into our life fits into his eternal plan of salvation for us. But we know that it is a plan that has been bringing us from brokenness, and it's a plan to bring us to glory. So I pray it's enough for you to know that your dear Epiphany Lord Jesus, your dear Epiphany Savior Jesus, that he loves you. And that because he is control, he has been exercising and leveraging that control to exercise his love in your life. I pray that it's enough for you to know that God the Father, he, will never, he has promised that he will never leave you or forsake you. And he has proved to you over and over and over again, when you don't don't let the devil whisper in your ear, does God really love you? He has proved to you throughout history that you can trust him. And that he will never let go of his clutches on you. He's working. He has been working. He will continue to work to finish what he has started. I pray that it is enough for you to know that your God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is working in your life 24-7. God is working for your good. And we know this, not because we have seen it, but because God said so. And God doesn't lie. Let that be your assurance in the days and weeks and months that lie ahead. 
your epiphany, Lord, has moved heaven and earth to make you a citizen of heaven. Don't despise that. Cling to that. Amen. Please rise. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding, it will guard and it will keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.